Hi folks, thanks for joining me and welcome back to the channel once again. Uh, had a little short break and in that break we seem to have gone from this, uh, in the UK at least, this perpetual winter where it's been uh, snowing, hailing, gales, lots and lots of rain and really cold right through uh, April straight into May. And uh, here we are, it's the uh, end of the first week in June and it's now, yeah, it's summer again. Um, so back to the t-shirts and uh, Maybe it's even a bit warm for the jacket, but I like to be smart, so we'll carry on. Anyway, today, yes, we, you know what you're here for. It's the English Electric Lightning, the mother of all jet fighters. Um, this aircraft was truly remarkable. And if, you, if you're not aware of it because of perhaps the region you live in, you've really missed out on a treat. Um, this was developed uh, under a totally all-British aircraft. In fact, it's the last all-British jet fighter, air superiority jet fighter. Totally made in the UK, um, and it was basically designed in. It was actually had its first flight in August 1954, which is very, very early if you think about it, because it's only 10 years after D Day. It's, you know, it's not even 10 years since the end of World War II. So uh, they, did, they designed this basically to counter the potential threat uh, to the British nuclear V bomber bases. They wanted to have a fighter that could go up and intercept any threat from Russia, Soviet Union, um, and they just basically went for broke and went for an aircraft that is uh, all out performance, no compromises given really, so it, uh, when I say no compromises in terms of performance it does have some compromises as a result of that sort of diktat, so in terms of its, by the way hear me sniffling, I'm sorry it's because the, the summer's arrived and it's a bit A fever, suffering a bit, you know it's quite warm, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so yeah, the um, you know they basically wanted a it's a shrink wrapped aircraft. It's got two Br Bristol Avon engines stacked one on top of the other, which gives it the most phenomenal rate of climb. I mean, this thing if you've never seen it or heard about it, uh, it would go take off, get to the end of the runway, and then literally pitch vertical and go straight up, literally like a rocket, quite literally like a rocket. Uh, and the sound it made was just ear splitting and I've actually seen this once myself, uh, not at an air show, actually at uh, an RAF base in, uh, in England when I was a child. One of these came on a visit and did this, actually, he, he actually didn't do it at takeoff, he did it before he came in. He came in, did a low pass down the runway and then went <laughs> vertical straight to the stars. Absolutely unbelievable. And I was about seven years old, I nearly wet my pants to be honest. <laughs> it was just a very leaves an impression. An incredible fighter. So it's capable of Mach 2, the first Mach 2 British fighter jet. Um, one uh, one pilot only, obviously. Uh, air to air heat seeking missiles. I think I think those are red tops. I'm not sure. Oh no, fire streak actually. Um, and the other thing about this aircraft, I've talked about it climbing. Well, its rate of climb was uh, the numbers are astonishing. So this thing could climb. Uh, obviously, it's got a top speed of Mach 2 level flight, but um, in a dive, probably Mach 2.5 or something. But its rate of climb was 20,000 feet per minute. I mean, this is just unheard of. In 1954, you know, nine years after the end of the Second World War. Wow, this is like something from a science fiction film. Uh, and they were very popular with the pilots. A very easy and forgiving plane to fly, unlike its sort of American rival, the Starfighter, which was the opposite, very nasty and quite dangerous. The Lightning was very forgiving, it's very manoeuvrable, easy to land at low speed. Uh, everybody loved it. Everybody. Not quite everybody. The engineers didn't love it. The maintenance guys on the ground, they hated it. And the reason is, as I mentioned, this shrink wrapping effect of really no compromise. It's very slender, fuselage and swept wings and tails. There was no room for, you know, maintenance, getting your hands in, access. Very difficult to work on. They'd often have to set the whole engine out to, to do any minor work. So they, they were quoted as um, saying that there were the number of flight hours between maintenance was officially 40 but in reality it was more like 20 which isn't a lot actually if you think about it so quite a high maintenance plane and the other Achilles heel that it had of course was uh, fuel consumption because this thing just burned fuel like I mean this is not an environmentally friendly aircraft no no this is one of the most unenvironmentally friendly aircraft apart from the Phantom the B-52 and Concorde probably it was that era wasn't it <laughs> anyway We've got something special here today, getting back to the model. So we've got the Airfix, this has been loaned to me, I don't own this one. It's the English Electric F1, F1A, F2 or F3. So 
So you've got various different options. Um, now this is claimed to be, by most people who know, this is claimed to be the daddy when it comes to a 148 scale model of the Lightning because other people have done it like Trumpeter and one or two others but they've not been great, you know, the accuracy's been off. This is actually, supposedly, a very good kit. So, I'm not very keen on the boxing or the box art, if I'm honest. The image on the front reminds me, I'm bringing a bit. It sort of reminds me of, uh, you know, Thunderbirds a little bit, doesn't it? The, the sort of, uh, almost the, that era of the 1960s sort of colour schemes, you know. Um, perhaps a bit retro, but uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, on the side, you've just got another image of it. Uh, very, very simple sort of artwork. It's um, kit number 09179. And then the other end, it's just a load of blurb in different languages, which says nothing really. Uh, apart from that it is made by Humbrol. Now this is the Humbrol ownership, not the Hornby ownership. And so this is actually a uh, product of 1998. It's surprising me because it looks earlier than that to me. It looks more like 88. But I thought it was 89 until I checked. So 1998, so right at the end of the 20th century, this is what Humbrol came out with. I mean the artwork on the Humbrol kits was never... I'm not knocking it, it's just a bit of a lack of character. There's not much going on, is there really? Um, yeah, it's uh, Humbrol, of course, went, they went busting that the Airfix Humbrol owned um, iteration of the company went out of business, and then of course Hornby took it, bought it. Anyway, without further ado, let's see if it's as good as people say. I just want to give a word of caution now. You know that I'm a, most of you know that I'm a lover of matchbox kits because they are so easy to make, and uh, for youngsters, especially in that era. They had some. Yeah, the colours, I know as a, as a more mature, sensible modeler, the colours perhaps do seem a bit silly now, but at the time they were great. If you were a youngster, they were absolutely brilliant. But they had no flash and they went together properly. Airfix did not do those two things. Quite a lot of their kits were horribly flashy, didn't get together well, were always warped, looked like they'd all been done on a Friday afternoon and were really not good. You know, the quality control was poor. The military kits, they came in no armour, you know, the instructions were vague at times and there, everything was in black and white and there was no proper colour guide. I hated it, I hated that era, that 1970s, 80s Airfix era. I'm not trying to knock Airfix, today they're, well, thankfully they're a completely different kettle of fish and they're already doing some really good stuff now. If you saw the Victor review recently, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, so. Let's not expect too much there from the overall package, but is the kit good? That's what we're really interested in. Let's have a look. So, carefully, yeah, the box has seen better days. You probably notice it's quite dished. Uh, and it's had a bit of damp or something, but uh, we'll put that carefully down so it doesn't get any worse. And uh, now, the owner who very kindly loaned me this um, has said that I could open the bags. Now, I think one of them may be open and the other one isn't, I don't think so. We will see. And we will have a proper look at everything. And he's got some aftermarket here, that's good. Okay, right. Here is a gentleman in the box. Right, now. Oops. Uh, one thing that Airfix did do better than Matchbox was their uh, tissue for the decals. Theirs doesn't seem to age like Matchbox always goes horrible yellow brown. <laughs> um, the Airfix doesn't. And I think this is the, we'll start with this. This is the uh, Airfix's own decals, I think, in house. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, ageing going on here, but you know, it is, what's that, 32 years old? 33 years old in fact, 30, third of a century, it's quite a long time isn't it? So they're actually in fairly good condition I'd say. Um, and what have we got? Let's bring you in. So you can see it properly. Now then. So we have here, uh, number 74 squadron. This is the uh, one with the tigers on it. Which look really nice I have to say. Uh, and some chevrons, and then we've got the Phoenix, which is all that's featured on the box, which is a 56 Squadron here. Again, some more chevrons, slightly different checkerboard design. And then we've got, uh, is that the Lucas Squadron? 92 Squadron, I think that's Lucas. Uh, this is very much the air defence squadron to go up against any Soviet bombers. 23 Squadron, is that been broken? I'm trying to remember the bases they were at. And then 29 squadron this one so you've got five choices which is brilliant isn't it that's really impressive oh no, there's, there's another one there's another one six six choices look at this you've got bring it out so big there we go look at that uh that is one 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 squadron so you've got six to go out that's a really good 
a good option sheet in terms of giving you plenty of options on the deck also. I like that. Mm, not so keen on these carrier films. There's quite a lot of carrier film there, isn't there? Around the uh, letters and numbers. That you might want to trim down a bit. But you've got um, stencils here, these fire strength missiles, or your red top air to air missile. Uh, you've got instrumentation decals there. Looks okay. Although I think uh, the owner here, he's going to wisely get himself some really good resin, so probably wouldn't use that. But they look very nice, don't they? Um, can't see anything wrong with those. Looks very great. So let's have a look at this instructions, and let's um, bring you out a bit for this. So we can see what we're doing. Now then. Uh, yeah, for 1998 it's a bit, hmm, a bit low rent. I mean there is a photograph which I think is great, but it's black and white. It doesn't look like a something from the last two years of the 20th century really, does it? It looks a bit older than that, but never mind. So Umbra weren't splashing the cash. Um, bit of history, some of which I've just explained. Let's get straight into these instructions. So, we've got obviously got a pilot, which is good because a lot of kits are not including pilots these days. I'm getting buzzed by a helicopter, very low. It's training day today, so that may happen a few times. Yeah, we live near a, not far from a training base, the RAF. Anyway, ejector seat. Ejector seat, and I think, again, the, we've got resin here to cover that, so uh, we'll look at that later. But, uh, yeah, you've got, it shows you there the decals that you would use if you haven't got the resin set, going into your cockpit tub. And then you put it in your ejector seat with its uh, headrest, seat, uh, the main surround, you've got your ejector, um, ejector seat, emergency pull, release system, stick, and then we've got that all coming together with the instruments. And you've got options on whether you want the pilot's legs bent or straight out. I'm not entirely sure why you'd want that, but anyway. And then it shows, this is explaining the way that the intake system works. So now we're onto the intakes at the bottom here. So you've got your cone, which is the um, speed reduction cone. That, that reduces the speed of the air rushing in at Mach 2 uh, and baffles it slightly, I think, as it goes into the engine. You don't want supersonic air. Um, the engine can't take that. It's just too fast for the engine to process. Uh, and the power blades, um, yeah, they get into trouble. So it shows the relative positions of all that and reminds you that you need to put 20 grams of weight in the nose. Then we've got that um, intake uh, cone system going into the actual overall intake trunk in itself and then you've got the impeller for the jet engine or the front one. Because they're slightly staggered I think in this. I think the lower one is slightly ahead of the higher one. They, they were sort of, sort of slight staggering effect. Then you've got your tailpipes and your uh, thrust exhaust um, jet pipes at the back. Yeah. Uh, then we've got uh, the afterburner rings which can be seen from the rear. Um, and obviously these uh, sorry, these uh, are going to be, you need to be painting those obviously because they are visible and whoops you've got quite a few holes to drill it would seem here so that's something to be very wary of you got one two three four five eight eight nine holes one two three four five six eight eight holes and then there's um there's more holes to worry about when you come to uh the wings you've got the first of all you've got the aerons uh which are that's actually the flaps, isn't it? It's confused me on the lightning because the aerons are kind of on the tips of the wings, aren't they? And the big hinge. And they're kind of um, flaps. Are they flapperons? It might be flapperons. I should have done more research. Um, yeah, I've got a feeling that they're flaps or flapperons. Anyway, you've got another hole to drill there if you've got a um, refueling probe to go in. And then you repeat the whole process on the other side, putting the top and bottom of your wing together. And then you've got your cockpit canopy here coming in. Uh, I have to say these instructions are lovely and clear, aren't they? They're not over fussy or crowded, which is always good. And that's very much like Airfix have continued that today, really. Now you've got all these options. So you've got the, uh, are you going to go for the F3 or, or the F1? Because if you go for the F3, you've got a different tail, which is the flat top tail, not the pointy, rounded pointy one. 
and then we've got all these parts coming together. So you get your uh, vertical stabiliser tail, you've got your tail planes, uh, which look like posable, are they? I think they're posable. Um, and you've got your wings coming in, putting on your cockpit canopy. I'd leave that to the end though if I were you, to be honest, otherwise you get into trouble with all sorts of problems. Clearly here you've got the cannons for in the nose, which is cool. So that's very good. And you've got your uh, intake ring that goes around the code at the front there. And, and down here you've also got some air brakes to take care of. And don't forget to paint in the actual, if you're going to have them open you'll need to paint in the, uh, in the, the bay. Then we've got your undercarriage, and of course on the lining it has this huge uh, single wheel and tyre on each side. Really meaty, very very chunky undercarriage. Unlike later planes which went with multiple wheels. Um, although the Tornado didn't, did it? The Tornado copied this style really, with the big wheels. But this is just big leg, big wheel, really huge undercarriage, yeah, main gear and quite a chunky front nose leg as well. So you're doing those, then you're putting them in and you know, all your actuator arms and uh, the gear doors going in there. Same on the other side, repeating that process again. Then, a couple of holes to drill again. You've got, depending on which uh, variant you're going to have the uh, refueling probe, you're going to have some intakes that need holes drilling. I'm a bit Bit surprised the ethics want you to drill holes just for things like intakes. There's a lot of hole drilling going on here, that's a bit strange. Don't think you get that so much these days because it's not an optional item, those are just intakes there at stage 22. Don't understand that. And, and, and beyond, it's, it's all stuff that's on every model, so why? <laughs> why didn't they drill the hole? Anyway, okay. Uh, oh, what did I tell you about ethics? <laughs> no, I shouldn't be too harsh, it's, uh, it's just the way they've gone about it. I mean. Perhaps they felt that, that you drill a bit more precise hole than they can mould a hole. And then we've got um, now we've got cannon uh, exits here, muzzles uh, here. If you look, now that's for the aid and gun, of course, underneath, which is in the belly. It's carried in the belly. Uh, aid and cannon. So that's that's quite good. You've got you've got a blank, or you've got the depending on the version on the F2. It, sometimes it carried an aid, and sometimes it didn't. So you've got a blanking plate or you've got the, the muzzle opening. Then you've got the red top missile, which is the early variant of the air-to-air -air missile, soon superseded by Fire Streak. And then you've got these options near the end, you've got the F1, and you've got obviously that's got Fire Streak, and F1A and F F one A and F2 have got a strake underneath, which the other one doesn't have on both sides of the fuselage. That's like um a trim straight, isn't it? I wonder what that's about. I'm not sure. Unless it's antenna, it's probably antenna. Yeah, probably radio antennas down the side. And then you've got the F3, which has the red top, but it gives you the option to have fire streak. So hmm, I would have thought that red top came first, but uh, not sure about that. And then finally, you've got the call out. So you, your plane's built then. You've got your call outs. And we've got RBF Coltishall, of course, which was the main lightning squadron for the east coast of England uh, to defend the North Sea, um, not far from Norwich. And that's the silver with uh, black on the top, the Tigers. Then you've got the, the one that's on the cover, which is the RAF Wattisham. That's in Suffolk. Uh, Wattisham now, by the way, is um, a base for the Apache helicopter. There's a, that's the British Army Apache helicopter squadron is based there. No aircraft, no fixed wing. Uh, and that's quite nice, that's silver with the blue, was it the blue or the red? Red, wasn't it? Yeah, the red. It's the red top on the spine. Uh, and it's worth just mentioning, one thing I forgot to mention, of course, was I said about fuel. I'll come to it in a minute, I'll talk about fuel. Uh, just just remind me to talk about the spine. Then we've got the Leckenfield, which has got the blue top, I think it is. They're all silver, but with different variants. Then we've got Lucas in Scotland with a white top, I think it is white top and then we've got an old silver one at Wattisham, uh, 29 squadron and then finally another one at Wattisham, the 111 squadron which is the commanding officer's aircraft with the nice lightning bolt through his uh, roundel which is really nice and then finally we come to the many stencils, not too many I don't think, yeah, it's quite a few <laughs> and it uh, 
And it's quite clever, they give you quite a, a sensible key here about which stencils belong to which aircraft. Because clearly they don't all share the same stencils. Same here. Top and bottom. And then lastly, and oh, this is quite good actually, isn't it? They've actually bothered to put in some proper photos to help you reference photos. A reference of the cockpit and seat. And then the gear here. And one or two of the aircraft in flight or on the ground. Quite nice, I didn't put it in colour though, isn't it, to be honest? Hmm, well actually that's um, uh, pretty good, I thought actually. They're nice and clear, aren't they? I would like a bit more colour and maybe some more photos, but no, it's good. It's good. There's it nicely with those, uh, those decals, decals, decals. Somebody told me, told, me, told me off about this and said, you never pronounce it right. Sorry. Decals, that's what I've been told is the correct pronunciation. Uh, it comes from the French and he explained it, and uh, I can't remember the full explanation now, but it was decal. So there we go, I stand corrected. <laughs> anyway, I was going to talk about the fuel consumption, About it was ferocious obviously, and this is the problem with the light, and you have to keep refueling it. So, the later models there, I think the F6 onwards, the F9 was it? Um, they had overwing uh, pylons fitted, and that, they carried overwing fuel tanks, which looked like, looked like rockets, but they're not on the fuel tank. Um, and that gave it a lot more range, of course, um, and that was, uh, that was that was probably the biggest downside to lightning. It was constantly needing refueling, you know. To do combat air patrol when they do this quick action, uh, quick reaction alert to scramble to meet a threat from Soviet bombers, they could only probably be up there for about 40 minutes and then they're going to need refueling, so it's not long, you know. So that was the uh, the one thing that uh, obviously later when the tornado came well they used the phantom didn't they the phantom kind of took over from the line and then the tornado f3 mainly anyway we've got some beautiful resin here look at this now these look really nice i'm not going to open the resin pack you'll have to forgive me for that not being my own but i think we can see pretty well what we have here just look at some of the details on this seat and all the wiring behind it if I just kill my lights a little bit, that might help us. There we go. I think you see a bit better now. There you go. Look at that. Some really fine detail. All the wiring and the control mechanism, uh, power boxes, etc. And then the seat itself here. Can you see that? That's very, very nice resin. True detail, I don't know this company, but I noticed that they come with some really good instructions, an assembly guide, which is beautiful. Uh, American company, obviously. Texas, though. Made in Texas. How about that? Well, the good old boys in Texas have done us proud here because they've got really clear instructions. They've got a full explanation about you know the actual components of the seat. Um, they've got dry fit all the parts. This is excellent. I've got to say that's probably the best resin instructions I've seen ever. There's some really clear, you know, airfix-like instructions. And it shows you on the other side how it goes in, how it sits in relation to the canopy, and the positioning. That, that's a nice resin set. I can see why he's bought this. I want to make a mental note. So that's true details. Uh, their, their kit number is 49013. That, that is Awesome, frankly. It's got all the panel side panels as well for the instrumentation, um, for the side of the uh, cockpit, and you've got your ejection pulls, the seat top. It's all there, isn't it? Yeah, I like that. That's very good. I'm sure you have good fun when you make this. Um, now, then. now we have a bag here that. Oh, this is sealed. Now I was told uh, very clearly that I was to not hold back on opening this one so I think that's what we will do now if I can do this in a sensitive way or can I mm. it's not the if you can see this I'm going to zoom out it's not the cleverest way of airfix uh, bagging something look at this so they've got to put a seam down here and then they've just left the excess bag on the other side seems a bit wasteful and I don't think I can open that very cleanly really um, See what I'll do. I think I'll open it lengthways, it'll be easy to reseal afterwards. Let's do that. Get a trusty knife out. Let's so try and be careful here, as careful as we can. Let's do it that way. I think it's going to be easier to get back in. And it'll seal up better. 
There we go. Now then, let's see what this is like. There we go. Yes, it's worked. No damage. No parts have come out. No parts have loose. Everything's good. Right. So, pop that to one side. I'm going to show you this. So the main fuselage, let's have a look. Ooh, I think you'll like this. Yes, this looks really, really good. So we've got some very, very fine panel lining. Very, very, uh, very sort of uh, subtle, but clear, very consistent looking from the top to the bottom. Uh, can't see any. There's not much detail in this um, this spot here where you've got the uh, air brake. They don't seem to have any internal detail. I'm not quite sure what the original aircraft looks like inside that bay, but anyway, um, this is your sort of Aiden gun pod underneath. APU, I think that is. Oh no, that's sorry. That's for the um, that's where your uh, tailplane goes in the pivot point. Hmm. There's nothing not to like here, I've got to say. It's a um, very nice finish. It's got like a satin finish to it. Um, yeah, they've done a good job here. This is nice. Uh, now, just imagination, or does the other side look a bit more. I don't think I'm imagining it. I don't know if you're going to see this on the camera. On the other side, the access panel here, just there, that seems a bit more defined. A bit deeper, perhaps, but quite the same depth. I think a bit clearer. I like it, but on the other, but the first side it is a little bit shallower. They're not quite identical. <laughs> it's not a major problem. Uh, I don't think you'd notice, would you, if you weren't looking at it in this form? Uh, you'd never spot it, really. But yeah, I think they are. I think they are all on the other side. A little bit more depth to the panel lines, perhaps. A bit more defined. But it's very nice. You know, there's lots of detail there. All the little hatches are there. Grills, little intakes here, and a knacker type of intakes there, little triangular ones. Like it. Nice, nice sprue that. Let's have a look on the wings now then. Let's not put that there because we know what will happen and be in trouble. I'll be able to focus. So, yeah, there's a few marks on this kit um, purely caused by. The sprues rubbing together because they put multiple sprues in one bag, which is a little bit annoying, I think. Uh, too many manufacturers do that, even today, so you know, just stop it, guys. It's, you know, you're not going to save the planet, it's just an excuse. To, it's, so, save the planet and put it all in one bag. No, you just destroy the plane, you're going to rub it all down. Anyway, here we have the ailerons at the end of the wing. Look at that, you see the all the little uh, hinges for the aileron. And you've got various uh, access hatches, I think those are for the fuel tanks that are in the wings. That's really nice. I say there's just a bit of scuffing on the surface, just, just wants to polish up really, but I say if they didn't put them all in one bag, you wouldn't have that problem. You don't have that with Tamiya ever. It's that every every sprue comes in a separate bag. That's nice though, isn't it? It's really uh, all the uh, the panel, the various panels and the rivets running down here, they're all very clear. Nice. Nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing a swipe of a sanding stick wouldn't fix. Then we've got our flaps. And again, nicely moulded. There's no flash on any of this, which is a bit of a relief. I was dreading that this is going to be a flash city model, but no, nope, it seems to be fine. And then we've got our gear doors, main gear doors on the wings. And then you've got sure what that is actually one of the one of the panels I think yeah I think it's inside the wheel the wheel bay where the uh, I think the leg of the wheel goes in there very nice okay that's that one done we'll rebag that shortly seal it back up again this one we don't need to worry about because it's already open it's slightly different design I'm not sure why okay so he's in there Let's see what's going on. Quite a bit of flash on this sprue. Too many flashes on the parts. So now we have the sprue with the underside of those wings. 
And again, actually this is um, better protected so it hasn't got the scuffing the same. It looks, it looks a bit nicer condition. Maybe a little bit, but not too bad. Uh, and it's got some nice detail. Look at this, you can see the little vents under the leading edge there of the wheel. Just here. Oops, little vent. That's nice. Uh, we've got our uh, impeller uh, fan blades, the engine, and here obviously the the afterburner rings. And tailplanes, which not all moulded in one piece, which is good, it saves you problems. They look nice, don't they? Looks, the shape looks excellent, I've got to say, it looks spot on. Over here we've got the optional two tailplanes. So we've got the, the more pointy one, albeit with a polished rounded tip. That's the F1, I think. And then the F2, F3, I think it is, has got the flattened off uh, top on the tail. We've got our trunking here for the intake of the engine. There's our cone that goes on the front nose. And a couple of bits of... Uh, what have we got here? Slats. Yep, we've got take off high wing uh, alley slats. And then here we've got the uh, the piping for the tailpipe. Very nice. Nothing wrong with it. There's no flash on the parts that I can see to worry us. I've got a fly in here. I will remove it. Anyway, it's come out again. Yeah, it just buzzed past me did that fly. I'm just buzzing to my coffee. <laughs> right. Um, so now we've got all the other parts, so let's have a closer look, there's quite, quite a lot of detail here. So, we've got the doors, various doors, and uh, we've got here the air brake doors. We've got, now here we've got the covers for the, where the, where the gun, uh, the cannon and the Aiden gun pod goes. Now this I'm not very impressed with, just look at this. Um, can you see how shallowly moulded that is? That's supposed to be the muzzle of the gun. Two different versions, one underneath, one on top. But it's just so ill-defined, that is a bit rubbish. That's going to lose a couple of points for that, I'm afraid. That doesn't look right at all. Even on a, a more modern 72nd scale airfix uh, Lightning, it looks more defined than that. That's very odd. Why have they done that, I wonder? Having a bit of trouble with their moulding, but it looks really poor, that. Very odd. Anyway, um, then we've got the main cockpit tub here and your ejector seat, or the back of, and then we have the, the main intake ring there, and then the afterburner jet, ultimate jet pipes, exhaust pipes at the back there. We've got our red top and fire streak missiles, which is which dude, I think, I think this is fire streak, this one, I think this is red top, if I remember correctly, that way around, and then you've got all the little fins, the stabilisation fins for them, and you've got your little pylons on which they will be mounted here, and you've got various little uh, fins and uh, aerials here. Here's your pilot, and he looks really good. That's a really nice airfix pilot. I like it. I'm not sure what they're saying about his legs. I think that he's like a generic pilot, and he won't fit in the line. And you've got to break his legs off. <laughs> got, you've got to kneecap him. <laughs> nice. That's what it is. But anyway, it's a nice pilot. It looks really well figured and quite sharply moulded. It's very good. Your, um, your front nose leg gear here. And then you've got your main gear legs here. And then of course you've got your main gear wheels and tyres there. And your nose wheel there. And it's got combing in front of the canopy, cockpit instrumentation, there's the instruments themselves and you've got various actuators for your um, landing gear and then you've got your tailpipes, internal afterburner pipes very nice, they're nicely moulded aren't they, they look good can't fault it and then you've got the ejector seat, with the ejector seat pull handles on the top which you grab with both hands and say your prayers I guess <laughs> But uh, that's really nice. That's really nice. Okay, well, we're nearly done actually. That's amazing. It's a nice kit, isn't it? There's no flash, it's just on the, uh, purely on the spread. 
Now we did a, when I first got this out a few minutes before showing it on the film, we uh, had a slight issue where we've got uh, the clear parts and the main, it's actually broken in the middle here, I don't know if you can see that. See that? Yeah, there we go. It's, it's actually broken there. And the main canopy is off the sprue, so to protect it I just, I just popped it into a separate bag. So we just, this is actually its original bag. Just get it out so we don't get any scratching or nastiness on it. Uh, and I have to say that it's really rather a nice canopy, is this? That's the main canopy. And it's really, really clear. Uh, good detail. Fairly, you know, it's pretty scratch free. It's perhaps the plastic's a little bit duller than you get in a modern kit. Um, the clarity is a bit dull, I mean. Uh, a little bit of distortion, but nothing. Yeah, maybe a little bit, if you can see that. But it's really nice, I mean, you know, for 98 that's pretty good. And then we've got the main windscreen section there, which looks quite nice. That doesn't look distorted, but again, a little bit sort of dull, a bit cloudy looking perhaps compared to modern uh, kits. And you've got various lights and, uh, you know, indicators and things that are on the aircraft. So we'll very carefully pop that back uh, so there's no damage to any of this. And that one can go in there. There we are. Now then. So what have we got? Let's have a look in. Just bring it back into shot. Um, so, zoom you out and see what the heck's going on. So there we have it. So that's the Airfix F1, F1A, F2 and F3 English Electric Lightning. A phenomenal or inspiring jet, you know, people in the 60s when these were coming into the RAF, people were just blown away by it. Um, there's a very famous book, a children's book, which I was read um, when I lived just close to this, only about 10, 15 miles away, perhaps oh, 20 miles from this airbase, Coltishall, uh, about the Coltishall airbase, a book called Thunder and Lightnings by a lady called Jan Mark. I uh, strongly recommend this to you. Uh, if you've got any kids, you definitely should get it and read it to them or let them read it. Because it's really, it's about the excitement of aviation. Oh, it's, it's a brilliant book. It was intoxicating. I got this, having had it read to me, and it was on Jack and Ori on BBC in, uh, I think, about 1973, 74. And it was so, uh, that the experiences of these two boys um, near this lightning base, uh, and it's basically as the lightnings are being phased out in the mid 70s and the, the bringing in the Jaguar, the Sepakat Jaguar, an Anglo-French uh, design, which is a really good aircraft as well, but perhaps not as, not as, as much of an outright fighter. Perhaps not as glamorous, certainly wasn't seen so as it arrived. And it's about, this happens at the end of the story basically, there's a young boy who's a little bit, he has some learning difficulties. And uh, but he's an expert on, on aircraft, he knows everything about it. And Lightning is his favorite aircraft, and he's absolutely obsessed with these aircraft. And this other young boy with his family come to live just close by, and he become, become friends. Um, and at the end of the story, uh, suddenly the Jaguars arrive, and this, this child is absolutely devastated, and he's in tears literally. And it's so moving, and it's like, oh. You know, it's a little lesson for life. It's not, it's not that serious, you know. But all things, all good things come to an end, you know, basically. Um, anyway, thunder and lightnings. I recommend you get that book if you love the lightning, because uh, you will enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. And there's lots of things about, you know, that being a youngster in the 60s, 70s, that people will smile about. If you like nostalgia, which a lot of my viewers do, you got to get that book. I should have, I should have produced it. Uh, I've got it in my collection somewhere. Thunder and Lightnings by Jan Mark. Anyway, that's what was a tip for you. Anyway, back to the kit. Everybody says it goes together really well, this kit. Um, it looks right, it looks absolutely bob on, uh, shape wise. Um, bit disappointed, um, really just with um, the guns, the, the, uh, the muzzle for the guns, that was very weird. They hadn't, it's like they hadn't really bothered, a bit of an afterthought. So I'll have to knock it a couple of points off from that, but I think I'll give it eight and a half out of 10. I think that's going to build into a fantastic lightning, you know, uh, a brilliant model, brilliant model. And they, they did a later um, boxing of it as well, which you can get, um, and that's worth having as well. But these are changing hands for quite a lot of money on eBay now. Um, I looked at, on eBay a couple of uh, weeks ago and it was 
uh, one guy had a starting price of £55 on an auction for seven days. It's going to go to about £100. Another one had one at £94, I think, £94.99, buy it now. So I think between £80 and £100 is the going price for these, so that's why we have to be a bit careful, you know. Um, anyway, you've got to see it. I was allowed to open the bag, so um, thank you to the owner for lending it me. Um, I'm a bit jealous because I have been looking at these. <laughs> um, and I'd like a lining. I've got I've got a Revel one, 70 second scale. It's not great. I'm not impressed with it really, but I do have a 70 second scale Airfix F6, so I'll have to build that. Anyway, I'm digressing. Eight and a half out of ten. I think that's fair. Nice kit. If you can get your hands on one at a sensible price, you know, maybe if you go to a model show and you see it in the second hand, have a good look. If it's in good good condition, get yourself one of those. Anyway, I hope you'll give me at least 9 out of 10 the thumbs up. Um, and if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you are a regular subscriber, uh, don't forget to ding the notification bell because that's going to help you make sure you get early warning as to any upcoming videos that are probably going to be of interest to you. Uh, we've got a couple of others coming up very shortly. I won't spoil it by telling you what they are, but um, some different subjects. Um, so keep, keep subscribing, keep watching the channel. And in the meantime, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. A uh, little walk down memory lane for the, the halcyon days of the Cold War and the British jets. Uh, the pinnacle of British sort of jet technology really, when we were you know, able to do that on our own. Thank you for joining me, and until next time, stay safe, thanks a lot, and bye for now.